Whittington and His Cat A merchant once upon a time, who had great store of gold, among his household placed a boy, sore pinched by want and cold. No father and no mother watched, with love o'er this poor boy, whose dearest treasure was a cat, his pet and only joy, that came to him beseechingly when death was at the door, and kindly to relieve her wants he shared his little store. This boy was called Richard Whittington. He had lost his father and mother, and having no friends, had come up to London to seek his fortune. London streets, he had been told, were paved with gold. Alas, he found them only deep in mud and hard, hard with stones. After many privations and disappointments, and when nearly starved, he was taken into the house of a merchant named Fitzwarren. In this house he would have lived very happily if it had not been for the cook, who was very ill-natured, and who would beat him with the broom, and make him turn the spit on which was the roast meat like a dog. He was given a room in the garret in which to sleep, which was overrun with rats and mice. But Dick had brought up from his country town with him his dear cat, and this cat soon drove away the tormentors. A grateful cat, no mice might live, where she put up to dwell, and Whittington could sweetly sleep while Puss watched o'er his cell. Now it happened that soon after this the merchant, Mr. Fitzwarren, had a ship ready to sail with various commodities, which were to be sold or exchanged for others, whereby he would gain great profit. Now it was customary at that time for a master to ask his servants if they would like to venture their little savings in the same vessel, and so give them a chance of turning their money over and increasing their little stores. Now all the servants in Mr. Fitzwarren's house gave up something to embark in the venture, and the master asked Dick Whittington what he would put into the ship. But poor Dick had nothing save his pussycat, and rather than not have some share in the venture, but with tears in his eyes, he gave up his cat at the advice of Alice, the merchant's daughter. So says the ballad. Now, by the strand, a gallant ship lay ready to set sail. When spoke the merchant, ho, oh, prepare to catch the favoring gale. And each who will his fortune try, haste get your goods on board. The gains ye all shall share with me, whate'er they may afford. From distant lands where precious musks and jewels rare are found. What joy to waft across the seas their spoils to English ground. So hasted then each one on board with what he best could find before the ship for Afric's strand flew swiftly with the wind. The little boy, he was so poor, no goods he had to try. And as he stood and saw the ship, a tear bedimmed his eye, to think how fortune smiled on all, except on his sad lot, as if he were, by gracious heaven, neglected and forgot. The merchant and his daughter too, fair Alice, marked his grief, and with a gentle woman's heart, intent on kind relief, she bade him bring his cat to try, her fortune o'er the sea. Who knows, she said, what she may catch in gratitude to thee. With weeping and with sore lament, he brought poor puss on board, and now the ship stood out for sea with England's produce stored. And as she sped far out of sight, his heart was like to break. His friend was gone that shared his crust, far sweeter for her sake. Humble his lot 
the merchant knew, but knew not that the cook, with blows and cuffs the boy assailed, in surly word and look, until his life a burden seemed too grievous to be borne. Though Alice oft would pity him, so lowly and forlorn. The cross-grained cook was very angry at the kindness shown to poor Dick by Alice, and she treated him more roughly than before, and sneered at him for having sent his cat to sea. Do you suppose, she said, that your cat will sell for sufficient to buy a stick wherewith I may thrash you? At length poor Whittington could endure this harsh treatment no longer, and he resolved that he would run away and seek his luck elsewhere. So he packed up his few goods in a bundle and started one morning, All Saints' Day, which is the first of November, and he walked as far as Holloway, which was then all fields, and there were no houses. There he sat himself down on a stone, which to this day remains, and is called Dick Whittington's Stone, and he was very sad to think how solitary he was in the world, and how badly he had fared. Moreover, he could not tell which way he should go. While he was thus considering, the bells of Bow Church, which at that time were only six, began to ring for service, and their sound, borne on the breeze, seemed to say to him, Turn again, Whittington, thrice Lord Mayor of London. The same words would come with the chime of the bells again, and over again into his head. He tried to laugh, and began to cry, and still the bells rang on. Turn again, Whittington, thrice Lord Mayor of London. He shook his head, and stood up, and took a few steps along the road to Finchley. But he had not gone far before he heard the bells again calling out, Turn again, Whittington, thrice Lord Mayor of London. And somehow he did not fancy the Finchley Road. So he turned back, and he now took the road to Enfield. But he had not taken many steps along that way before again he heard bow bells, and they still sang in his ear. Turn again, Whittington, thrice Lord Mayor of London. Then he laughed through his tears, and said to himself, Lord Mayor of London, that is a strange notion. But after all, Mr. Fitzwarren was good to me, and so was Mistress Alice, and perhaps I can bear the ill nature of the cook if I have the thought before me that I shall be Lord Mayor of London and ride in a coach. So Dick walked back by the way he had come and got into his master's house before the cook came downstairs. Now the very first news which came to his ears that morning when he got back to the house were glad tidings. Good news, he quickly hears, how that a richly laden ship amid ten thousand cheers, has entered port from distant climes, full freighted with their gold by traffic gained for English wares, in honest barter sold. With shout and song the crew rejoiced, not less the folk on shore, told of adventures strange and rare among the black amour, and how their king was glad to see our English sailors bold, who sat and ate and drank with him from cups of purest gold. Once a day, amid their cheer, when healths went gaily round, how were the crew amazed to see in swarms upon the ground unnumbered rats and mice rush forth 
and seized the goodly cheer, while stood the wondering guests aloof, o'erwhelmed with dread and fear. Oh, said the king, what sums I'd give to rid me of such vile, detested brutes whose ravages our bed and board defile. Now when the captain and sailors heard this, they recollected the cat of Dick Whittington. So they told the king that they had an animal on board which would rid him very speedily of all the vermin. Bring the beast to me, said the king. And if it be as you say, I will lade your vessel with gold dust in exchange for it. So the captain sent a sailor to the ship whilst a second dinner was being got ready. The sailor soon caught the puss, tucked her under his arm, and arrived at the palace in time to see the swarm of rats rush in to eat up the second meal that had been served. Now when the cat saw and smelt the rats, wish she went out of the sailor's arms, and away she rushed upon the rats, and nipped and killed them one after another, and those who saw her and had time fled to their holes like wind. The king laughed and kicked his feet about, and clapped his hands, and was so delighted that he said he must and would have the beast even if it cost him half his kingdom. The captain now called the cat to him and showed her to the king, who at first was afraid to touch her, but after a while, to show his manliness and his royal fearlessness, put out a finger and touched the cat, who at once began to purr. The king had never heard this sound before, and it frightened him and he went under the table. But presently he put out his head from under the tablecloth to ask if all was safe. When he was assured that the cat would do him no harm, then, like a man and a hero, he came back to his place and becoming bolder with impunity patted the cat. After a while, even the queen summoned courage to caress the cat and say, Puss! puss, whereupon the cat stepped into her lap, coiled herself up, and went to sleep. The king was now quite determined to have the cat. He bargained with the captain to buy all the rest of the ship's cargo, but in payment for the cat he gave ten bags, all full of the finest gold dust. The captain then took leave of the king, and having a fair wind, set sail for England, and after a prosperous voyage, arrived safely in London port. This was the news that reached Dick Whittington that morning of All Saints' Day when he returned to his master's house, and now as he heard it, he no longer thought that the bow bells told what was impossible as he was master of ten great sacks of gold dust. Now the cook was jealous and went to Mr. Fitzwarren and told him that all the treasure was too much for a poor scullion. But the master was a good man and he said, God forbid that I should rob the boy of a single penny. He shall have all the gold dust to the last pinch. Then he sent for Dick, but the boy said, I have only hobnailed boots and cannot go into the parlor. However, Mr. Fitzwarren insisted, and he came in very modestly, and his master told him all the truth about his good fortune and called him Mr. Whittington. Poor Dick was overwhelmed with his good luck and wanted the master to take half of it. But Mr. Fitzwarren said, No, it is all your own, but what I will do is to advise you how to dispose of it. Now Dick was so kind-hearted that he made a present of some of the gold to all his fellow servants, and to the captain and sailors of the ship. He did not even neglect the cross-grained cook. 
After this, Mr. Fitzwarren sent for a tailor and had Dick dressed as a gentleman and told him he was welcome to live in his house till he could provide himself with one of his own. When Whittington's face was washed and his hair curled and he was dressed smart, then he looked a very handsome fellow, and that Miss Alice thought. She who had formerly looked on him with compassion now considered him fit to be her companion, and soon afterwards her suitor, the more so because Mr. Whittington was constantly making her the prettiest presence imaginable. At the end of three years, Mr. Fitzwarren, perceiving the affection of Mr. Whittington and his daughter for each other, consented to unite them in marriage, and accordingly a day for the wedding was soon fixed, and they were attended to church by the Lord Mayor, the Aldermen, the Sheriffs, and a great number of the wealthiest merchants in London. There was a grand entertainment afterwards, at which the poor were feasted as well as the rich. History tells us that Whittington and his lady lived in great splendor and were very happy, that they had several children, that he was Sheriff of London, and three times afterwards Lord Mayor, that in the last year of his mayoralty he entertained King Henry V on his return from the Battle of Agincourt, upon which occasion the king knighted him by the style and title of Sir Richard Whittington. It is told that he then entertained the king at a great banquet, when King Henry said, Never had a prince such a subject, to which Whittington replied, Never had a subject such a prince. Sir Richard Whittington constantly fed great numbers of the poor. He built a church and added a college to it, with lodgings and a yearly allowance to thirteen poor scholars. He also erected a great part of St. Bartholomew's Hospital in Smithfield. History has not told us what became of the property left by him for the support of the church and the thirteen poor scholars, but it is believed it was seized by King Henry VIII at the time of the Reformation, as that king seized upon many of the lands which were left for religious purposes. But those which Whittington left for building and endowing almshouses met with a better fate, and Whittington's almshouses remain to this day. Here ends the story of Whittington and his cat, from which we may see how that honesty and industry met with success, and that charity and piety are the best ornaments of the rich. <laughs>